All right. Well, I really appreciate the uh, the invitation and um, look forward to having a, a, a great discussion if we have time afterwards. So I've entitled my presentation Prenatal Maternal Hardship and Traumatic Stress from Population Level Disasters and Effects on the Unborn Child. What happens to you may be more important than how you react to it. So I'm going to start off this, this talk by um, showing you uh, an email that I received from a young woman in New York City uh, in March 2020. So as you may recall, this was the very beginning of the pandemic. New York City was one of the hot spots uh, in the world uh, for COVID-19 deaths. So Katya wrote to me, when I was a student in university, I learned about your study of prenatal maternal stress during the ice storm in Quebec and the development of the children. Is it possible that the stress from the pandemic could influence the development of my child? So I think this is a great launching place because we're still in the, the throes of the pandemic. So we need to try to understand exactly uh, what was Katya concerned about? What's the greater context of stress in pregnancy? So conventional wisdom say from 50 or 100 years ago, was the idea that the, the fetus was the perfect parasite, that it was inside the womb, that it couldn't see anything, couldn't hear anything, and had no idea what was going on in the mother's world, and would take whatever it needed in terms of nutrients and everything else from the mother, even if it was at the mother's expense. Well, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, we've been thinking more about the concept of fetal programming. The idea that the environment of the fetus can somehow alter its programming. Um, fetal programming very often is thinking about a very negative outcome. And that's a bit been replaced by the whole notion of DOHAD, the developmental origins of health and disease, where um, the, the outcomes could be positive could be negative, but somehow the, the act of the placenta is, is having an effect on the development of the unborn child. So if we consider, for example, a woman who's going through the Fort McMurray, Alberta wildfires uh, in 2016, and she's fleeing for her life and her family's life, of course, there's gonna be some kind of stress. And the idea is that that stress is somehow um, getting through the placenta and sending a signal to the fetus to alter its development. So the placenta in a way acts like a perceptual organ. So in the same way that your eyes uh, look at the environment, perceive the environment and try to keep you out of harm's way, the placenta may also be a perceptual organ that is somehow taking in information about the mother's environment. So in this case, the mother fleeing for her life um, practically through the flames uh, of this wildfire, the signal is getting uh, to the child. But there's a, there's a new concept, which is that of the predictive adaptive response. The idea that the message that is getting to the fetus is not simply to harm the fetus or to, um, to be a prenatal insult per se, but it might also be attempting to prepare that fetus for the outside world. So for example, um, this particular fetus uh, might turn out to be highly vigilant the, with the idea that the environment is highly threatening. And, but that vigilant, that vigilance, if for example, there is no threat anymore as the child grows up, there's a mismatch between that prenatal environment and the postnatal environment. So this vigilance might actually be seen by their teachers in school as an attention deficit disorder. So as being disruptive in a way. So there's a mismatch between that prenatal environment and the postnatal environment. But when we think about this fetal programming, this uh, development, um, developmental origins of health and disease, it's really quite complicated. So we have this stressor on this pregnant woman. And if my slides would advance, yes. And that stress can lead to some um, problems in the mother's um, uh, well being itself. So she can have mental health problems like anxiety and depression. Uh, this might lead to unhealthy behaviors like substance use, uh, could lead to domestic violence in the family. 
And especially those unhealthy behaviors could have their own independent effect on the development, the development of the fetus. At the same time, if my, yes. At the same time, the stress could have a direct effect as we mentioned through the placenta. It could have an indirect effect by influencing preterm birth, uh, the risk for preterm birth. And all of these could lead to um, changes in the unborn child in terms of their long-term mental health cognitive development, uh, cardiometabolic outcomes, and so on. So it's hard to really know then also, also there's an effect potentially of those maternal mental health problems continuing to influence child development. So the questions I'm gonna to try to answer today are first of all, you know, what do we mean by stress? Second, what are the associations between different aspects of maternal stress and pregnancy and, for example, birth outcomes or maternal postpartum mental health and especially child outcomes? Third, what are the kinds of things that might protect both the mother and the child? And if we have time, we can talk a bit about the, the pandemic. So there is a huge literature on prenatal maternal stress but very often they mean quite different things uh, when they talk about stress. So these pictures here uh, um, indicate that there are a number of large scale but retrospective studies of major events, uh, population level disasters like, uh, like the war, uh, World War II or, or like natural disasters like tornadoes. Those are great um, except for that when you're looking at large administrative databases, you don't have information about what actually happened to individual people. So they can establish that there is a risk factor for prenatal stress, but not very much information after that. Then there are a number of prospective studies that look at pregnant women and they, they follow along the various kinds of uh, everyday life events, if you will, um, that happen during the pregnancy. But these kinds of life events are really not very common um, but also they're not randomly assigned. So people are not randomly assigned to get fired or to get divorced while they're pregnant. So, you know, what does that mean and what kinds of complications does that mean methodologically in terms of interpreting, interpreting your, your results? And there's another huge field of research looking at prenatal maternal quote unquote stress, where they're looking at maternal anxiety, maternal depression. Um, but there again, if a pregnant woman who is highly anxious, has a child that grows up to be anxious, how can we tease apart how much of that effect is a genetic transmission of uh, anxiety? How much of that is the prenatal maternal environment, you know, the intrauterine environment? How much of that is also being raised by a mother who has a tendency to be anxious? So it's very hard to tease apart what exactly is the effect of, of stress. So what we would really like to have is animal research. You know, animal research is fantastic because it can randomly assign pregnant animals to stress or non-stress conditions that control, can control exactly the timing in uh, gestation that the stress occurs and so on. But, you know, rats will not answer our questionnaires about how they were actually feeling or what they were thinking uh, as they were being squeezed into a little box. So we are also a whole lot more complicated than um, laboratory animals. So what we really need is we need some kind of a model or um, a context of stress in humans. So uh, Lazarus and Folkman have a model that they published in 1984 in which the whole stress experience starts with some kind of objective external situation or an event. And the first response of the person is cognitive appraisal. And the first phase of cognitive appraisal is to think to themselves, is there actually a threat in this objective situation or event? And if they conclude that no, there is no threat, well, then they have no stress. That's, that's pretty clear. If they say, yeah, there is a threat here, well, then they go through a second uh, phase of cognitive appraisal, and they try to evaluate, do I have the resources I need to actually cope with this particular threat? If they determine that, yes, I do have the resources to cope, 
then we might conclude that, yeah, there's, there is a stress, but it's a positive uh, motivating stress. If they think, no, um, I don't have this, the resources I need, then there's negative stress. That negative, dis, that negative stress then leads to subject to distress and uh, then will lead to the, uh, the activation of the HPA axis in the person, uh, which will give rise to stress hormones like cortisol. In the case of a, a person who's pregnant, that cortisol can actually um, pass through the barrier enzyme in the placenta and reach the unborn child. So this gives us a context in which to really think about each one of these kinds of studies uh, of stress. So we've got an objective hardship that happens, we've got a cognitive appraisal, the way we think about it, and then we've got our subjective to stress. So in order to really gain an understanding of prenatal maternal stress, what we need is some kind of a major stressor that first of all happens to pregnant humans. Second of all, it has to be outside of the woman's control and as much as possible have that distress uh, or have that um, hardship distributed randomly uh, within the sample or within the population. It needs to be applied to large numbers of pregnant women so that we have uh, sizable sample sizes for the kinds of statistics we need to do. It needs to affect the pregnant women from, to varying degrees. So we can look at kind of dose response uh, associations between the degree of stress and the various outcomes that we're looking at. It has to affect women at various stages of pregnancy because we believe that the timing is of importance uh, in, in terms of the, the outcomes for both the woman and the child. And it has to be the kind of an event that will allow researchers to get in there and assess the level of exposure and the woman's reaction as soon as possible after the event. And this is where Project Ice Storm comes in. So um, I don't know the extent to which people in the audience are familiar with an ice storm, um, but an ice storm is, uh, well, I'll describe what happened. So in January, 1998, we had five days of freezing rain. So it was actually three different wet weather systems that moved through uh, Southern Quebec and dropped freezing rain. So freezing rain happens when the temperature is just above freezing during the day, uh, rain falls and whatever it falls onto is gonna freeze there. And then of course at night, the temperatures go down. And so what happened in January was with these five days of freezing rain, the weight of the ice on the electrical poles and these, these pylons, the weight was so great that it actually toppled the pylons, toppled uh, electrical poles down the, the, the city streets and so on and essentially left 3 million Quebecers without electricity and for as long as 45 days in the coldest month of the year. So in response, there were 454 shelters that were established around uh, the region. These housed as many as 17,000 people on a single night. The economic costs were uh, $1.5 billion. That was the most expensive uh, natural disaster in Canadian history. There were 27 deaths that were attributed directly or indirectly to the ice storm. These were from people um, uh, lighting fires in their fireplaces and that, that would go up in flames. Uh, they would touch live wires, falling ice would hit people. People went to, had hypothermia and carbon monoxide poisoning from bringing their barbecues and other things into the house and um, poisoning themselves to death. So, um, when uh, myself, we were without electricity for, for one week, and it occurred to me that uh, this was an opportunity to study um, stress from a, an independent natural disaster um, prospectively. I figured that there were a lot of women out there that were pregnant uh, at this time. So I created a questionnaire that we sent out to pregnant women five months after the storm. And from the natural disaster literature, I saw that the things that were important to look at were uh, the degree of threat, the degree of loss, the scope of the disaster for each person and the amount of change. So I created a number of um, questionnaire items that would get at each one of these, um, these aspects of exposure to the disaster. 
And then I attributed points in such a way that uh, each scale would have a maximum number of uh, points. For the ice storm, it was eight points. For other disasters, uh, it was a different number, but they were equally weighted to come up with a total score. I also saw <laughs> kind of retrospectively that I had included in this questionnaire an item that I had gotten from, uh, from another source, which went like this. Taking into account all of the effects of the ice storm on you and your family, what would you say have been the overall consequences of the ice storm crisis? And people could choose between very negative, negative, neutral, positive, and very positive. And I was quite surprised to see that from the ice storm, that there was many people who said that it was either neutral or positive that said that it was a negative experience. And we looked at what they wrote in, uh, the people who saw it as a positive experience, very often uh, they had spent time uh, staying at maybe their in-laws or friends. And because there was no television, there was no electricity, they were actually able to share stories. And there was a lot of support and a lot of fun uh, in that. So in order to look at subjective distress, I saw that in the disaster literature, um, there's a scale called the, the Impact of Events Scale, revised, that looks at the severity of post-traumatic stress symptoms. And I thought that would be a good way to, um, to see how people uh, reacted to, uh, to the disaster. And so uh, each questionnaire, this one actually was for the Iowa flood study that I'll tell you about in a minute, um, but asks the person, about their avoidance symptoms, their intrusive thoughts and images, their levels of hyperarousal with respect to the disaster in question. So this, again, I just want to drive home the point that uh, we're looking really at three different aspects of uh, the stress experience. Um, for Project Ice Storm, I only had these uh, PTSD symptoms that are reported on at the time of their assessment, which is very often many months uh, after the disaster. And in the other disasters, we included two scales that were peritraumatic. That is, I know it's been six, seven, eight months since the disaster, but I would like you to think back and tell me how you were feeling at the time, at the height of the disaster. And so we have a a scale of distress and another one of dissociation. And then another really major aspect of these studies is looking at the timing. Because from the, the question or from the perspective of fetal programming, it's that organ or that part of the fetus that is in a period of rapid growth that is the most likely to be affected by any kind of uh, prenatal insult, whether it's alcohol or stress, um, whatever. So timing can be a very important uh, factor here. So from Project Dice Storm, I just want to say that we um, identified pregnant women through the offices of uh, obstetric comp of, uh, obstetricians. Uh, we identified 1,140 women who were pregnant at the time of the ice storm or in who became pregnant in the three months following the ice storm. We sent out the questionnaires to them, 1,140, and we got 224 back. That is a response rate of 15%. So in no way can I use results from Project Ice Storm to say what actually was the situation or what was the effect uh, on that region called the Motoregi where we were looking at women. So uh, on the other hand, although it's not an epidemiological catchment area type study, we can still look at the dose response um, between the level of stress and outcomes in the mom and the kid. So on average, the women in this study were without electricity for 15 days and some women for as long as 45 days. They were on average four days without telephone, uh, there were very few cell phones at the time, uh, but women were without phones, some of them for as long as 34 days. Only a third of the women never left their own home. So what happened was that the power grid failed gradually day after day, uh, more and more people lost power. And so you would move to one place, they would lose power, you'd move to the next place. So only a third of women never left their own home, half of them moved once or twice, and 15% of the, of, the, of the subjects moved up to 15 times. 
about 4% of the, the women met criteria for possible PTSD. This is about what you would expect from a natural disaster. Um, but the people in this study uh, were, had significantly higher socioeconomic status, education, and income than the regional averages. So again, we can't uh, consider that this is a representative sample. Six months after each woman's due date, we sent another questionnaire. Of those 224 women, 177 gave us permission to contact them again. So at six months, we got uh, questionnaires from 176 of them. 17% met criteria for postpartum depression. That's about the norm. 8% gave, gave birth preterm. Again, that's about what we would expect. So as I mentioned, we sent out that first questionnaire in June 98, five months after the beginning of the ice storm, uh, another one six months after the due date. And over the years, we have pestered these families repeatedly until most recently when the children were young adults, now 19 years old, uh, we were able to see them. So we, we saw them face to face, um, a subgroup of kids when they were two years old, five and a half, eight and a half, 11 and a half, six, uh, 13, 15, 16, uh, and 19. So I mentioned that there are other disasters. So Project Ice Storm is the longest running that went till age 19 and for which we have the most biological data. We, uh, 10 years after the ice storm, we saw that there were major floods in uh, the state of Iowa in the United States. And we collaborated with a group there. And interestingly, they had already been collecting data on pregnant women long before the flood happened. And so they had actually psychosocial data on those women before the flood. So here we have a pre-post uh, study of prenatal stress. But what we really wanted was samples of the placentas. So in 2011, uh, we were able to go to Australia and uh, recruit women uh, in the hospital and we got to samples of the placentas uh, for those who had been exposed in their first and second trimesters. Then we really wanted to do something uh, to help these women rather than just confirming time after time that prenatal stress uh, has an effect. So in 2016, we had these wildfires in the um, town of uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta, where a town of 80,000 people at the very end of the road, way up north, uh, with nothing but tundra uh, north of them, all 80,000 people had to evacuate in the span of a few hours. Uh, luckily, nobody was actually killed by the fire. But we included uh, an online expressive writing intervention. But our sample size was too small. So then a year later, when we saw that the city of Houston was underwater following Hurricane Harvey, um, this time we pulled out all the stops and we recruited over a thousand women and uh, tried the same expressive writing intervention. And then more recently, since 2020, um, I've been involved in three different studies of stress from COVID-19. So I'll try it over the next um, half an hour or so to give you an idea of uh, our results. So the main objectives of um, this, uh, what we call SPIRAL, the Stress and Pregnancy International Research Alliance. If you wanna look up our papers, they're here at mcgill.ca slash spiral. So the objectives of SPIRAL are first of all, to establish what are the actual parameters of prenatal maternal stress that have effects on specific outcomes uh, in the child, cognitive, behavioral, physical, and motor. And then what might moderate uh, those associations? So could prenatal care make a difference or social support or cognitive appraisal might moderate that effect? Then we also look at We look at mediators. So to what extent does prenatal stress influence things like uh, birth outcomes or mental health in the mother, uh, which might also then have an effect. And then also at child mediators. So does the stress influence uh, brain, cortisol, epigenetics and so on, which then might have an effect. So what I've highlighted in red here um, are the things that I'll be able to talk about uh, this morning. 
So if we look first at birth outcomes, for example, so we, we did not find any main effects of either the objective hardship or the subjective distress uh, on birth weight and uh, gestational age of birth, but we did find a main effect for the timing where um, the, the lowest birth weights were for, um, for pregnancies that been, had been exposed to the ice storm or the first or second trimester. And kind of the corollary of that is that the greatest percentage of children that were born premature were those that were exposed in the second trimester. But then we also found that there was a main effect, uh, not only of timing, but also of the severity of the subjective stress. So remember that's the um, postpartum, sorry, the uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms. So here we have the, the birth weight, and then if they were exposed early, middle, or late pregnancy, and we have this curvilinear association, but the more severe the PTSD symptoms of the mother five months after the ice storm, the lower was uh, the birth weight. So we did have um, an effect there. And this was something interesting I just wanna throw out there. Um, one of the uh, results that I had that I sat on for many years because I didn't know what to do about it was that when we actually looked at the um, head circumference and the length at birth, we saw that the, the greater the mom's stress, the bigger the head, but the shorter the body. And I had no idea what to do with that. But then I was speaking with um, uh, Patik Wadwa at University of California at Irvine. And he said, oh, that's head sparing or, or brain sparing. The idea that um, when, the, when the fetus, when there is a lot of environmental stress or some kind of an environmental insult, that the placenta will guide the development of the fetus in such a way that it spares the head. So you got to have a brain in order to deal with this stressful exterior environment, but you don't have to be tall. So it's not so much that the heads were big, um, but that the ratio uh, was altered. And we saw that that was a function not only of the level of subjective distress of the moms, their PTSD symptoms, but that it differed for boys and girls. So sex was moderating the association between subjective stress and this ratio of head circumference to birth length, such that um, those uh, boys, only in boys, did the level of subjective distress have an effect on that ratio. So as I mentioned, um, Project Ice Storm, the study that we started with um, 224 women, uh, was totally not representative of the, of the region. So uh, if you look at this um, map down here, you can see Montreal, the little black dot. And this area here is, is a region called the Montérégie. And that's where the, um, the disaster was the worst. And you can see that this very dark purple represents 100 millimeters of, of freezing rain that had fallen. Um, and here, here's just 50 millimeters in, uh, that has um, accumulated on a twig. Um, so these were the regions that the, was the most um, badly damaged. So we started a, a study that we used administrative data um, from Quebec for the three years before the ice storm and the three years after the ice storm. So we had a, a temporal control, but then we also wanted a geographic control. So the Montérégie is down here in the southernmost part of Quebec uh, near Montreal in purple. So we gathered data, not only from Montérégie, but also from uh, in here in kind of brown is the, the capital Quebec City, that region, and also the lower St. Lawrence region. So together, these were somewhat comparable in terms of socio socioeconomic status. So we use something called the difference in difference method where you look um, over time. So these are the three years before the ice storm, we could compare, and this is just a theoretical graph here. This is not actual data. You can see, is there a, is there a usual difference between these two regions? And is there like a trend over time? And uh, if let's say that this is the Notec AG with the diamonds or, or with the triangles, um, what would we expect in the year of for children born in 1998 and after? This is what we would expect if there's no effect, but then there might be a, 
a difference. So this is what's called the difference in difference method. And we published these data on the birth outcomes um, recently, just a, a few months ago. And when, when we looked at birth weight, uh, small for gestational age, large for gestational age, uh, preterm birth, the, the actual gestational age and weeks, what we found was that there was no difference. We could not find that there was uh, any kind of outcome in the Monteregie from 1998 forward that was different from what we would have expected. So we were also able to do some dose response analyses by estimating the days without power based on, power, on the, the postal code of these 94,000 um, births. And even there, we could not find that there was uh, a significant effect of um, the estimated days without power. So we didn't see any kind of a major effect. So what this suggests to me is um, a bit like the, the title of my talk, is that it's not so much what happens to you um, as it is the subjective distress, which of course we couldn't analyze in this administrative data, but which in our um, Project Ice Storm we saw was associated with uh, birth outcomes. So then let's see what, if we look forward and, and we look at the child outcomes. Uh, so when we look at child uh, cognitive development, when the kids were two years of age, we had a small grant, $20,000, uh, that allowed us to look at those kids whose mothers had very low objective hardship and those kids whose mothers had very high objective hardship. So uh, more days without electricity. And we didn't have enough money to include the, um, the, the, the moderate stress kids. But when we looked, this is actually a, a 10 point IQ difference at the age of two years that is associated only with objective exposure and subjective distress of the moms had no effect whatsoever. So 10 points in IQ, uh, the standard deviation is 15. So that's quite a large uh, effect. So then when we had, we finally got our first grant when the kids were five and a half and could look um, more extensively at the entire sample. And we saw that once again, at ages five and eight, that there continued to be this significant difference between low objective hardship, high objective hardship with no effect whatsoever of the mom's uh, subjective distress. Um, it changed a little bit when the kids were approaching adolescence where there was a difference between boys and girls, where the boys continued to have an effect, this time a linear effect of objective hardship where there was no longer an effect uh, in girls. We also looked at uh, the children's um, behavior problems, their, their psychological problems using the child behavior checklist. Here I'm showing you results for internalizing problems, which is anxiety, depression, withdrawal. So here we saw effects of both objective exposure and subjective distress. And you can see the results here for ages four, five, six, eight, nine, and 11 years. And with the objective exposure, we did have a significant effect of objective hardship at each age, but those effects were much more pronounced uh, looking at subjective distress. And, and these are the results actually controlling for objective hardship. Now, what this means, it's hard to tease apart, to, so to what extent is the mom's tendency to respond to a disaster with PTSD symptoms translate to a genetic predisposition in their children to, to um, have these internalizing problems. So there it's a little um, harder to tease apart. Based on um, some of the literature, when the kids were six and a half, uh, we decided to send out a questionnaire and ask the, the mothers about the children's autistic-like traits. So these kids are not autistic, but autistic-like traits can be seen as on a continuum. And here we saw that there was pretty much an equivalent um, effect from both objective exposure and the mother's subjective distress. So as I mentioned, we got our first grant um, when the kids were five and a half, so we could actually send uh, interviewers out to the homes. And as long as they were there, we thought, well, let's take their height and weight. You know, I, I had no expectation of what this would do, but I thought as long as we're there, we'll take height and weight. 
And what we found already when the kids were at age uh, five and a half was that if we were to um, split objective exposure into high and low, that those kids whose mothers were the longest without electricity, 15% of them met criteria for obesity compared to about 2% of those whose mothers had um, a shorter uh, or less extreme objective hardship. And that trend continued at eight and a half. And by the age of 11 and a half, nearly 30% of high objective hardship kids met criteria for obesity compared to about 6%. And when we looked even longer, like to age 15, we saw very clearly that not only was the effect uh, getting, uh, well, it was continuing on, where you might think that something that happens prenatally would wash out by the time the kids were at school age. Here we saw that the effect was continuing late into adolescence. And you can see that the size of the effect actually increased the older the kids got. So that gave us the idea that maybe we should take some uh, blood from these kids and, and look at other physiological parameters, uh, in particular insulin. So if these kids were having problems with obesity, what was this doing for their uh, insulin resistance? So at the age of 13, we convinced um, some kids to come into uh, school on, on Saturday mornings uh, before their breakfast and uh, give blood and drink the, the nasty um, uh, glucose solution. And here again, we saw it was the objective exposure to the ice storm. So their objective hardship that was significantly correlated uh, with their insulin resistance from a glucose tolerance test and not the mom's subjective distress. Um, an, another um, person in the lab, Franz Veru, um, took that blood and looked at various uh, measures of immune function, such as uh, cytokines, and saw that it was, again, only the objective exposure that predicted the levels of um, pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, and so on. So um, I could probably talk for two hours if I tried to give you all the results from Project Ice Storm, but uh, suffice to say that we did find that there were um, many effects of timing in the pregnancy of the ice storm. Uh, we were very impressed that the objective hardship had the uh, effects that it did. Uh, and that subjective distress was primarily um, predictive of, um, of um, behavioral outcomes, like internalizing, externalizing problems, um, but also some physical outcomes. So I have a student, uh, Sandra La Fortune, who decided to look not only at our studies, but other studies of natural disasters. And she published um, a meta-analysis of 37 studies uh, this year. And for, for many studies, um, they would maybe be looking at uh, subjective distress like anxiety or depression. Um, our studies and some other studies also looked at objective hardship. Um, and uh, our studies really looked at the cognitive appraisal. And what she found was that for all areas of child development that she looked at, there were significant effects of the severity of the objective hardship here in yellow, uh, and also for the degree of subjective distress. But that um, in general, there were not that big effects if we just looked at main effects of cognitive appraisal. So then she looked um, within the, the type of uh, disaster and saw that um, the, the effects of the ice storm uh, were significantly greater than the effects of studies from floods, in, including the two floods that, that uh, we were looking at. And our thoughts about that are that, that the ice storm was something that affected everybody. And so um, there, was, there was no getting away from it, right? Whereas floods, usually you can go a few miles and you're away from the flood and there are people there who are high and dry who can help you. But there was something about the global nature of the ice storm that had special effects. So we also wanted to look at moderators of uh, this effect. So in particular, what kinds of things might protect uh, the mom and the child um, from, uh, from, these, uh, from these disasters, from this stress? 
So I just wanted to show you some pictures from the, the Queensland floods in Australia in 2011, and just mention that actually this week there is equal or worse flooding in exactly uh, the same region. So we want to keep these people uh, in our thoughts. But back in 2011, I connected up with Professor uh, Sue Kilday, who was part of a, uh, a randomized control trial of two forms of prenatal care. Now in Australia, all babies are born uh, with the help of midwives. Even if they're in a hospital, the maternity ward is manned by um, midwives, not nurses or uh, necessarily doctors as in North America anyway. So um, what they were looking at was something called midwifery group practice to compare with standard care. So in standard care, there's no primary care. So when a pregnant woman goes to the clinic, they meet uh, you know, whichever midwife happens to be on, on duty that day. Um, their, uh, their, their prenatal care is maybe from a, a general practitioner um, or antenatal clinics or in hospital. And very often they're unfamiliar with uh, whichever midwife shows up at the birth. So it's an unknown person. Whereas midwifery group practice, mm -hmm. there's, um, there are three or four um, midwives in a group. So there's a primary caseload mid midwife, but others in that group. So the prenatal care and postpartum care up to six weeks um, are provided. And a known midwife is there at the time of the birth. So this, this uh, trial, you may be familiar with it, is called MANGO. And uh, most of the research that they've done on um, just in, in, not during the flood, but in regular time was that this midwifery group practice is a more positive birth experience for women. And it's even less expensive than the standard care. So after these floods, we were able to piggyback onto this study and look at, for example, uh, maternal mental health um, postpartum. And I don't know why my animation will never work when there are people watching. Okay, so one of the things we did was we administered the Edinburgh Postpartum uh, Depression Scale when the moms were uh, six weeks after birth. And we saw that those mothers who were in the group midwifery practice, this line in red, irrespective of the degree of objective hardship, uh, their depression levels were fairly low. As long as the hardship levels were low, it didn't make a difference what kind of um, prenatal care they were receiving. But for those women who were in the standard care, the, the greater the objective hardship from the floods, the higher was their um, postnatal uh, depression. We also looked at the development of the kids. So this is uh, when the kids were six months of age, the mothers completed uh, something called the ages and stages uh, questionnaire. And pretty much across the board, the children of mothers who had been randomized, recall, to the midwifery group practice had tended to have better outcomes, but had um, significantly better outcomes in fine motor and, and problem solving. So one of the reasons we believe that the uh, midwifery group practice um, has this effect could be through um, social support because those, those midwives and uh, their patients really developed a rapport um, that was very helpful. And we had actually found following the Iowa flood studies, um, you'll recall that in this study, they could control for the women's uh, anxiety and depression before the floods. And, and look at that trajectory over time. And they found that uh, the, the greater the social support, the, the more the women were protected from uh, the effects of the flood. And we have seen, yeah, we have seen uh, social support buffering um, pregnant women from, um, from distress and from objective hardship in the other studies as well. So from the Fort McMurray uh, wildfires, um, Barbara Verstraten uh, found that especially when peritraumatic distress, you'll remember that's the scale where we asked the women 
How distressed were you at the time driving down the road with walls of fire on either side? Um, how distressed were you? That as long as their distress was um, relatively low, that um, high social support satisfaction protected them from um, post-traumatic stress-like symptoms. But when the distress was extremely high, there the social support was no longer effective. Uh, Barbara also looked at um, positive uh, cognitive appraisal. So you'll recall that question where we asked, if you take everything about the disaster into account, would you say that the consequences on you and your family were negative, neutral, or positive? And uh, from the Fort McMurray fire, she saw that having a positive cognitive appraisal um, was very protective in levels of uh, high levels of objective hardship, where um, for people with a negative cognitive appraisal of the fires, the greater the objective uh, hardship, the greater were their um, PTSD-like symptoms. And I put this dotted green line there to show um, uh, a potential threshold for PTSD symptoms. So cognitive appraisal is, a, is a, one of the variables that we really kind of come to late uh, to analyze, but it is um, certainly appearing to be very powerful. Uh, if you attended the talk a, a, a couple of days ago by my former postdoc, uh, Lei Kao, you'll, uh, she probably would have mentioned that both objective hardship and cognitive appraisal uh, predicted uh, this, the, uh, the degree of uh, DNA methylation in those kids at age 13 where negative, where subjective distress did not. So here we really woke up to the idea that cognitive appraisal uh, was important. Another person in my lab, uh, Vincent Paquin, looked at, uh, again, the Queensland flood study in Australia. He looked at um, the mother's dis, uh, depression over time at 16, 30 months, uh, four years and six years postpartum and saw that for those women who had a negative cognitive appraisal uh, after the floods, that the, the greater their distress at the time of the flood, that uh, peri-traumatic distress inventory, the, the greater was their depression over time. Whereas for women who had a more positive um, cognitive appraisal, the more they were uh, protected. Okay, so what about COVID-19? So could we consider this as a natural disaster? So you'll remember that when I was talking about what is objective hardship, we had these categories of threat, loss, change, and scope. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has all of these. You know, in terms of threat, you know, we're told every day, wear a mask, get vaccinated. We're constantly reminded uh, with images on TV and on the internet um, about the level of threat. In terms of loss, there has been so much loss of jobs and income. Uh, we can consider certain loss of freedoms and change. Everything about um, our lives changed uh, starting in March uh, 2020, working remotely. I haven't left this office in two years or been back to my actual office. Some people have to work with young children at home. And it changed how we did everything. I, I don't know how many of you were like us, you know, washing off our groceries when they came back from the, from the store. And scope, if we think of scope in terms of the duration, well, it's never ending. And if we also think about the, um, the global impact, well, the entire globe is affected. Cognitive appraisal, it's kind of difficult to see the positive uh, in what people are going through. Although um, a postdoc of mine who had a baby last November was saying that it was actually kind of cool not to have to travel to all my meetings and just stay home and stay on Zoom and also to have my spouse at home. And of course, there's lots of anxiety and depression, uh, which would be normal responses to everything that we're going through. So um, I mentioned that we have a, a study in Australia of women. Um, it's called Birth in the Time of COVID or BITOC. Uh, we have about 3,000 women in that, uh, in that sample. And in our initial recruitment questionnaire, we included three very simple items. The cognitive appraisal item that you're familiar with, uh, this time going from one to seven, from negative to positive, 
We also asked a question about resilience. When things go wrong in my life, it generally takes me a long time to get back to normal. So um, high scores are that they strongly disagree. So that's positive, uh, that's good resilience. And then tolerance of uncertainty because everything is changing all the time. So we ask this question from an existing scale. Uncertainty makes me uneasy, anxious, stressed, vulnerable, unhappy, or sad. And that was rated zero, one, or two. So a student in my lab, uh, Amber Lee DiPaolo, uh, who actually is looking for graduate school work, um, she analyzed from the 415 women who were pregnant at the time of recruitment uh, and for whom we had two month postpartum anxiety ratings. Um, and she found that objective hardship um, tended, the greater the objective hardship, the greater their anxiety at two months postpartum. But for women who had um, positive cognitive appraisal in the blue line, uh, there was no effect where there was a significant effect for those who had um, a negative, moderately negative cognitive appraisal. Same thing for this resilience item. So uh, women with high resilience in purple were unaffected by the objective hardship were those who answered that it did take them a long time to bounce back. So women with low resilience, uh, they were significantly affected by the objective hardship. And the same with tolerance of uncertainty. So women who indicated that they, they, um, uh, they were not upset by uh, uncertainty, they were unaffected. Um, uh, first of all, we had a main effect, uh, no matter the severity of the objective hardship, um, but those who uh, were very intolerant of uncertainty had the worst effects. Okay, so what I said I would be talking about is the idea that what happens to you may be more important than how you react to it. So we saw a little bit of a mixed response to that, but yes, we do see that the degree of objective hardship. So, you know, just answering objective questions, how many days without power, uh, how much did you lose in income and so on, that this predict, predicts a lot of outcomes in child development, but especially when assessed at the individual level. So when we looked at the population of Quebec and compared those two regions, we really were not able to see very much. Um, and even in um, the, the PITAC study of, uh, of the COVID pandemic, when we look at the number of deaths in the region that has um, no, no discernible predictive power unless we're looking at the individual level, like how much did you lose? Do you have children uh, at home and so on? So objective hardship predicts many outcomes, um, but especially the cognitive and the physical development in the children. However, we did see that subjective dis distress, so the way the women were reacting to the disasters did play a role in some things such as birth outcomes. Um, and that might be why when we looked at the administrative data that we didn't see any effects. Um, and we do see that there is some effect of subjective distress uh, on mental health of the children, but there may be a genetic uh, explanation for that. We also see that maternal personality factors can be predictive, like uh, their, their tendency to think positively, their self-perceived level of resilience and tolerance of uncertainty and that there are other things in the social environment that can be protective, like the quality of prenatal care uh, and social support. So this woman who wrote to me from uh, New York City in March, 2020, um, in my explanation back to her, in my response, I mentioned that I think of a child as a bit like a beef stew, where the most important big chunks are really the genetics that um, those genetics are gonna establish kind of the high and low levels. So the range within which the child uh, will develop. But then other things can uh, kind of push that child up and down that genetic range. Like the, the potatoes are pretty big. So that could be maybe the diet or vitamins. You've also got the carrots. Uh, that might be, you know, did the mom drink alcohol or take drugs? And the peas might represent stress from COVID. So yes, um, we are seeing effects of prenatal stress, but those effects are relatively minor and probably less important than some of these other things. So I, I left her with this thought that, 
your baby has way more advantages being desired by loving parents who are intelligent and articulate than disadvantages. So she, uh, Alessia, this woman in New York City, did send me some pictures. Everything turned out all right. Um, and Alessia is uh, growing well. So that's um, all I'll mention today uh, with the time that I have. And so many different people uh, helped out on these studies. And I just want to mention that if you are interested in prenatal stress and child development, um, this uh, book just came out a few months ago, uh, edited by uh, these people with um, a dozen chapters. I have a chapter in there that summarizes um, all of our results from the various studies. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'm just going to leave you. I'll leave this slide up here. This is all the stuff I didn't have time to tell you that you might be interested in, but I'm uh, happy to take questions if uh, the organizers think there's, there's time. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, my mind is blown, thank you. I always have lots of questions, so I probably won't start with my own. So I'm going to go around the floor. So Antje from Switzerland has a question for you, Suzanne. Thank you very, very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, I just wondered when you talk about how children are the children of the future. I'll ask somebody to repeat the question because I didn't hear it. Repeat the question in the microphone. Uh, can you hear me now, Suzanne? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. I was saying thank you very much for a really inspiring talk and congratulations on your wonderful body of work. Um, I was just wondering, when you talk about hardship, to what extent does timing, to what extent does the duration um, of the stress play a role? So I was wondering, when you talk about hardship, you obviously focused on, for example, the seven days that the ice storm lasted. But what happened afterwards? So presumably then for some people, life, you know, houses were rebuilt and electricity was gained again and people sort of restarted their lives. Whereas I guess for some people that wasn't the case. So for me, the question was hardship, you know, where does it end? And um, to what extent were you able maybe to account, I guess, for these differential effects, if that makes any sense? Yeah, so the, um, in each one of the studies, our objective hardship questionnaire asked a lot of questions, um, had a lot of items, you know, fairly factual items, you know, on what date did you lose electricity and what date did it come back? Um, when, when did you leave your home? When did you come back to your home? Uh, which was really hard for the Fort McMurray wildfires, for example, because so many people lost their homes and they never went back. Um, so we've had to figure out how to, how to code these items. But um, so the, the duration is part of uh, the scale that we call scope, both the duration and the intensity. Um, so like the, the density of the neighborhood that was, that was affected and so on. So this all goes into a, a, a larger equation. Um, I would say that for Project Ice Storm, uh, because we only had two items for scope, one was the number of days without electricity, the other was days without telephone. Um, it, the duration was, was very important. But what, what also comes up um, sort of behind your question is the difference between an acute stressor and a chronic stressor. Um, and I feel very strongly, uh, not only based on my own work, but on base, based on a lot of other studies, that there's something that happens when all of a sudden the world changes for a person. And so we have always used the timing as the date of the onset of the, the big change or the date of the onset of the disaster. Um, so, and, and I, we've seen over and over again that that timing where it happened in the pregnancy uh, really is what determines which um, system in the child is gonna be uh, affected. Um, 
for the pandemic, you know, we're all still scratching our heads. So with the study in Australia, you know, we, we had a recruitment questionnaire, uh, but then the, the, the pandemic keeps going. So we'll say, okay, so now at two months, we're gonna ask them, okay, what two months postpartum, we're gonna ask them what's happened uh, throughout the entire pregnancy. And then, my gosh, it's still going on. So we have another questionnaire at six months where we ask what's happened since the birth uh, in terms of the, the, um, the, the pandemic. And now we're at 12 months and we're just putting together the 24 month postpartum questionnaire. And so the, the pandemic especially is a fantastic opportunity to see what happens over time with these really, really long disasters, um, you know, population level disasters. So I, I don't have a really good answer for you at this point, except to say that we're very much taking into account and in every one of the disasters, how long it lasts. But uh, I think the pandemic uh, results are gonna really tell us a lot about the difference between the acute onset, because I don't know about you, but I thought um, March and April, 2020 were the most stressful parts of uh, probably of my life, um, except the ice storm. Uh, so we'll be able to say eventually the difference between the acute. Thank you very much for that response. I suppose what I was wondering, uh, just a, a small follow up question. Did you ever ask people like what it to what, you know, when did they start feeling safe again? So from their subjective perception, when did the exposure stop? Or was it always that you defined the, the length from an objective point of view, if, if, you, if you want to see. What uh, so, so what we did, um, especially with the pandemic, because the, the PTSD questionnaire didn't make any sense, the peritraumatic distress, those questionnaires didn't make any sense at all for the pandemic. Um, and so we created our own scale of the subjective distress. And so at each one of these time points I mentioned, recruitment, two months, six months, 12 months, now 24 months, we always ask just their level of distress. So it doesn't answer specifically, I really like your question about um, when did you feel safe again? We've never asked that to anybody, um, but we should be seeing that in these questions about um, how distressed are you about this or that aspect of the pandemic and when does that uh, go very low. But that's a that's a great idea. When did you feel safe again? Suzanne, that's amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing if data are published around the women who had their second birth during the pandemic and, and how it varied when you were talking about acute versus chronic, like at what point does it become chronic, especially with the introduction of vaccination and things. So I'd be very interested to see the fact that the pandemic itself changed and our management changed. So fascinating to hear more from you in the future so for now Suzanne we say thank you so much it's been as I said the silver lining in the pandemic is we've been able to have you virtually with us and we mightn't have been able to do something like that before so we're so very grateful for your time and for sharing with us today and we just want to say thank you so much and please do keep in touch thank you thanks thank Suzanne. You very much. I hope to visit the wonderful country I've heard it's beautiful Thanks, Suzanne.